Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to the Science Centre here at Staffordshire University for what I think will be a really memorable talk. This is the Disability History Month lecture with a sporting icon. So a very warm welcome. Uh, we have a living legend with us tonight. He won't be embarrassed at all with me saying that. Um, he has 30, 30 um, gold medals at European, World and Paralympic level, 14 Paralympic gold medals. He is a Knight of the Realm, a CBE, an OBE, an MBE, and of course, an honorary doctor at this fine institution. Would you please give a warm stokey welcome for Sir Lee Pearson. <laughs> Thank you. Now then, my friend, we have a, we have a live studio audience. We have uh, lots of people watching online. What can we get away with? I don't know. We can get away with lots, can hopefully. We? This is more nerve-wracking than the, the Lorraine show the, really? the, the other month. And that, that was live as okay. well to well, the nation. What you need to know is he, he, I said to him a couple of weeks ago, shall we talk through the questions? And he said, ah, let's just, just, you just surprised me. So I am. Oh. So, uh, so, so, um, so, so let's start off with um, Lee's autobiography. I have to say, this is a beautiful, a beautiful, I mean, that's just the box. That's the box. I mean, you know, um, so, so it's called I Am Who I Am. Um, and um, it's not only a beautiful looking book, it's actually, if I may say so, searingly honest, unlike some of the life stories I've read. Um, and all the better for it. Can I just ask before we begin, why did you write the book? What, what, why did you do it? Um, well, my own label for myself is abnormal. I think I'm the most normal person. And then people say, no, you're really abnormal, Lee. And I don't think they're just on about my disability. I think they're just on about my personality and my humour and everything. And then everyone just kept saying, really, um, <laughs> your life is like, needs to be in, in, on print, basically, it needs to be in print. And, but it's weird talking about yourself because that's not the way I feel because my life is my life. And, I still wake up in the morning and think I need to do something with my life. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't really done it. I haven't really done enough. But everyone else was going, no, it needs to be in print. And then I got introduced to the publishers, and and they had a very brief um, outline of my life, and they were like, never mind, in print, it should should be a film. Um, and it was more for other people. It wasn't for my glory. It wasn't to make lots of money, because it, it won't make lots of money, it's still wiping its bottom at the moment. So, um, and as somebody discussed with you, we could have gone with big publishers, but the book wouldn't have been around maybe in 10, 20 years time. So I went with the smaller publishers where the, the book has longevity. And the, if anyone in the future is born with a disability, struggles with a sexuality, as a disabled child, they can perhaps think, oh, I might read Lee's book and see how he dealt with it. So he wanted it to be available for, for a long time really so it was more that other people were telling me to write a book not that i thought anybody would find my life interesting it's really good if you haven't read it i highly recommend it just in time for christmas there are some copies here signed and i'm not on commission honestly um so should we start at the beginning uh silly you were born on february the 4th 1974 just up the road at the north staff royal infirmary mm -hmm. Would you mind if I share a few paragraphs from the book with the audience? Nope, that's a go for it. I'm going to read from the book. So this is the first paragraph of Silly's autobiography. They put me in a broom cupboard. Can you believe it? I wasn't placed in the tender arms of my mum or dad. The heavens didn't open and the angels didn't sing. Instead, I was packed away like an old vacuum cleaner and left to gather dust. The first three days of my life, was spent in a windowless room with bottles of Vileda and chamois leathers. Amazing, isn't it? It's a wonder I didn't become a window cleaner. <laughs> I'd like to begin my autobiography by telling you that upon my birth, I was greeted by a room full of happy, smiling faces, that I was comforted in the warm and loving embrace of a doting mother, and that everybody commented on how beautiful I was. But I can't, because I wasn't. None of that happened. When I entered the world on February the 4th, 1974, the nurses took one long, horrified look at my malformed limbs and the birthmarks and decided to secrete me in a broom cupboard, a rotten, stinking broom cupboard. For three days, I was holed up among mattresses and bedding, cleaning equipment and spare cots. I was tucked out of sight and out of mind while the nurses at the North Staff's Royal Infirmary decided what to do. 
I wasn't the only one being kept in the dark. My mum was heavily sedated and spent the first 72 hours of my life not knowing whether I was alive or dead. Poor woman, she nearly went out of her mind with worry. For three days she lay waiting for news, not knowing what had happened to her beautiful baby boy. You couldn't make it up. I just thought I'd wait and see what the reaction was from the room because I know what my reaction upon reading that for the first time was. Those, those are your words, Sir Lee. Mm. It's your li Lee lived experience. Is We've, it just Lee now? Just We're going Lee for now. Lee. We're going yeah, for Lee. Just Lee, going now. For Lee. So they're your words and it's your lived experience. Mm. Sitting here now, you're 47, hugely successful career as an athlete. Um, you look back on that, on that moment, that period, you know, what are your feelings towards that and the people involved? Well, it's shocking. Um, my feelings go to more towards my parents because uh, my memory is like a sieve anyway. So I certainly cannot rem can't remember my birth. Um, it's shocking to read it. And, and as I've said to you, I've not actually, I've written the book, but I've not read the book. So it was written over seven years and uh, edited uh, over seven years, changed, but I've never actually read the book from start to finish. Um, so when you read that, I know it's me blatantly um, and it's my story, but um, it feels like you're talking about somebody else. But I also really feel for my parents because when you talk about my mom, I see a now in her 70s, but she was actually 25 at the time. So you've got, and you look at 20, at our age, you look at 25 year olds and they look like teenagers still. They look very, very young to psychologically have to cope with that trauma, really. Um, and, uh, and when you love your parents like I do, even though it's in history, you just feel so sad that, that, they, that they went through something as terrible as that and yes we're 47 but that only goes back to the 70s and you didn't think that um that would have happened to children in 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 the 70s uh they must have fed me we don't know to this day what they what they did or they didn't feed me I expected perhaps that i wouldn't be around but i was much more deformed than i was now and as you've read the book it goes on to 14 major operations to iron me out my half my face was a birthmark, which which just disappeared. It was one of those that wasn't raised or anything. And my mom, uh, when she told me that, uh, said that if I ever got angry, she says, but you rarely get angry. You, she could see that one side of my face would get like more blushed than the other, apparently. I don't know. I never look in the mirror getting angry. Um, and then there was a birthmark on top of my head that was cut off as well. That was separate to my disability, which was arthrogryphosis multiplex congenita. I'm really glad you said that. I knew you'd want me it's to say that. It's worth about 500 <laughs> points in Scrabble, and I thought, how am I going to say that? I just, <laughs> I've um, never used it in Scrabble <laughs> yet. Um, which basically is, um, although when you see me stood or, or, or sat, my legs are encased in plastic now to support me, to split me up and I walk with crutches, it looks like a joint in a, in a, in a bone condition. But genetically, when I was in the womb, um, the muscle fibers, your muscle fibers grew like an elastic band. My muscle fibers grew like string. So that uh, even so, the muscles instigated the issue, which then bent the bones and the and the didn't allow the joints to grow correctly. So I was born in like a Buddha position uh, by cesarean. The right foot was wrapped around the left knee. Uh, the left foot was wrapped around the right knee. My arms were deadly straight, uh, but the shoulders were totally rotated. So if you don't come back to my shoulders in in a minute, if if you want to, because I can, I can tell you something that's even more, makes me very tearful. Um, and yeah, half my face was a birthmark and I had a birthmark on top as well. Thank you for being so candid. I just want to explain to people a little bit further, if I can, about, about the condition. So it manifested itself in a number of ways, is my understanding. So the muscles in your arms and legs grew as scar tissue mm. inside the womb mm. and your bones weren't able to grow correctly and your limbs were very thin and twisted. Mm -hmm. Um, none of this, however, matters to your mum, does it? Because she sees you for the first time. She comes out of this 72-hour period of sedation, wants to know, demands to know mm -hmm. what's happened to you. Because they'd also um, put her on a ward where people had lost their babies, so, and she hadn't actually got, had a direct answer to whether she'd got a live baby, so she presumed 
that I was dead, um, but she hadn't actually been told that. So they wheel her down the corridor, as I understand, into the broom cupboard, um, and she scoops you up. She just sees you, takes a deep breath, I guess, mm. picks you up, scoops you up, and gives you the first cuddle mm. uh, of, of many, I guess. Yeah. There was a reason for that, though. But, um, yes, that's what she would, would have done anyway, and that's what you want to believe a mother would do. But <laughs> it's interesting that I was left there for three days, but she as she was being wheeled down the corridor, she just felt all the professionals, in inverted commas, following her. And she was worried that if she was to react badly, she wouldn't get to see me again. So as a mother, she wanted to do that, but probably overriding that, because we have a very honest relationship, she was more worried that if she reacted badly, then she wouldn't see me So she's going down the corridor and she's strategizing this. She's yeah. actually with it enough to actually yep. think, I've got to play, play this right. Yep. Um, you've dedicated your autobiography to mum and dad. You're really close to your parents, mm. really close to your mum. But when she got out of that wheelchair and she walked over to a cot with a blanket and I said, well, what did you do? And she said, well, I, I removed the blanket. And I said, and what did you think? She said, do you want the truth? And I said, yeah. She says, I thought, oh shit. It's like, great, thanks, Mum. The first thought of me was, oh shit. She says, yeah, it was, you were right, state. She says, but well, I just picked you up and hugged you. And I've got two older brothers that are able-bodied and Mum and Dad just vowed that um, they would certainly wouldn't treat me special, but they would give me, would encourage me to have the same opportunities as my older brothers. And that was the kind of ethos of my upbringing. So I just feel like I owed them uh, everything really and, and why I'm here today really. Your early childhood as you just alluded to Lee w was mm. was really tough because you uh, I, I guess very different to to most young children because by the age of six mm. you've had 14 major operations. Mm. Um, how much of, of that time and, and those procedures do, do you remember? I remember flashbacks um, and uh, it was just very, very, very painful. I remember I was splinted up in, in, in castings uh, for a lot of the time. And I remember one casting was my, for my hips, with my legs spread apart, with bars, two bars keeping your legs apart. So to be casted from your hips right the way down to your toes. I just remember it pulling and very, very heavy. But um, going back to shoulders and my parents and, and me feeling having sympathy for my mum. One of the worst stories that my mum ever told me was I was a toddler, so I could, I could verbalise and I could speak. And she said, um, to get your shoulders to go back, we had to tie you to a crucifix every day. And, uh, and I said, okay, that sounds quite horrific. And she just said, you, you would look up at me and say, please don't do this to me, mummy. And that, that's when I get tearful, because mm. I can't imagine somebody in the 20s having to tie their baby this is for good reasons, mm -hmm. uh, to a crucifix whilst, whilst, your, whilst your son is saying, please don't do this to me. And the strength that my mum must have had to keep doing that and, uh, and for my good, but even so, kind of is a reflection on how um, what an amazing character uh, my mum and dad are. So talking about the family, mm -hmm. uh, you're the youngest of three brothers. Uh, Mum was a nurse? Yep, Dad psychiatric a, nurse. Psychiatric nurse. Dad was a trucker? Yep. Um, what was home like, life like for you in, in that period? C can you remember, did, you know, how, how did the family adapt to your disability and, and, and you know, what, what was different? What, you know, what can you remember? There was absolutely no adaptions whatsoever. Um, I was living in Leek when I was born and then when I was three we moved to a hamlet of houses called Bassford Green. My dad bought his mum's house when she, she moved on. Um, and I don't, what did mum say? I think we had uh, 15 pounds to live on for the month because the house really was a semi-detached house with a little bit of land and it. And that was like obviously more than they could afford it. But it was very much like the Waltons living up. So some people want you to believe that they, even with my condition, you had a, had a, had a, a, a terrible, childhood or it was really tough. The operations were really tough, but I was never um, 
I was never led to believe that I was different than anybody. Mm -hmm. So in later years, even now, I'm no better than anybody else and I'm no worse than anybody else. And you probably read the psychology kind of about that being just a disabled person in a shop where you might make feel, someone feel uncomfortable if you're in the queue next to them or still at the bar. And then from that, you go to a Paralympian where people are calling you an inspiration. And I don't accept any of those. I don't take on board if someone feels uncomfortable being near me with my disability um, or my sexuality. And I don't take on board that I'm an inspiration. I just stay on a level. So that was probably a lot to do with my upbringing that um, I was never I was, I was never told you couldn't do that because you got a disability. Um, I, was, uh, I was never allowed to do more than, uh, get away with things more than my brothers because of my disability. I was just treated normally to the fact that I had an amazing childhood. Dad used to put me on adult motocross bikes where I could only just touch the pedals. He would push me off in third gear, leave me going around the field. So if it, if it stalled or ran out of fuel, I would have just hit the floor. They allowed me to go horse riding. I couldn't water ski because this foot went out. My brothers and dad were water skiing. So dad got a pl some ply board and made a giant penny with, and chopped off some wellies because there wasn't clogs in there. They chopped off some wellies that shoved me foot and, and uh, added rope to the front. But what he didn't do, he didn't put a lip at the front. So I ended, ended up under the sea like a, like a penny dropping, <laughs> dropping in a well more than I did on top of the sea. So part, part of me thinks that they, they allowed me to do everything and, and were very inspired. Another part of me thinks, I think they were trying to kill me off, <laughs> secretly. Horse riding, adult motorbikes when you're going to reach the pedals, water skiing under the water, plus others. So no, I was very lucky, yeah. They had a little bit of land and, and um, grew and they up made the me. most of it. Yeah, we, we had a lot of fun, a lot of animals and a, and a lot of fun. Talking about fun, so I don't me, know where you're going to go let, now. Let, let, let me, well, he, wanted, he didn't want to see the questions, did he? <laughs> um, so 1980, you're six, and your parents surprise you um, by telling you that they're going to dress you up smartly and take you in a black cab, which you're very excited about, to, to be, because you've been shortlisted. Going back, the, I was yeah. in the bath when this surprise came. Oh, on. right, one okay, walked, go on. Mum yeah. walked in with a brown velvet suit, and I thought, how horrific. Nice. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this woman's yeah, got yeah. no dress sense whatsoever. <laughs> well, even then. Even then. <laughs> right, okay. And, so, uh, so, so, so and, you, and then I asked, why on earth have you come in the bathroom when yeah. I'm in the bath with a, with, a, with a brown velvet suit? She says, we're going to London tomorrow. And I said, oh, are we? To, and uh, she says, yes, tomorrow. You're going to visit uh, the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all oh, right, that's good. But do I get to go in a black cab? And she said, yeah. And that was far more exciting for me yes. than seeing the Prime Minister. Uh, absolutely. Now, of course, in, in 1980, the Prime Minister was none other than Margaret Thatcher. And the cab driver never charged us. Did he not? No. Um, so so you, get, you get to meet Mor Morecambe and Wise. This, yep. is, this is, by the way, a competition organised by Woman's Own magazine. Yep. Um, and it's the, the National Children, Children of Courage. Courage. Yeah. Um, and, and you're shortlisted with, with many 12 others. Or the, 12, 12 children 12, in total. 12 in total. Um, and, and is it right that there, there is a, there, so there's a picture, I won't show you because, you know, I'm not sure who's watching, but there is a, an, an, a frankly horrific picture in the book of yourself doing the conga with the Iron Lady, which I can't unsee. Um, so I, thought it, you meant the naked, <laughs> I thought you meant the naked No, the naked picture. picture's fine, but you oh. doing the conga with Margaret Thatcher, I, I can't unsee that. that. So it far. needs its own health warning. So <laughs> is, it, is it right that, Mrs. Thatcher carried you up the stairs. Well, um, yes, it is. It is right, but there's a little story behind that because um, we we were at Ten Downing Street, and then the dinner was upstairs. And in Number Ten, there's a big there's a big staircase, and there's there's photos of all the previous prime ministers. And out of the twelve children, she walked over to my parents and said, "I'd like to carry Lee up the stairs." And my dad said, "He's really awkward to carry with his legs positioned like this in plastic. He's like carrying a crab." So, no, I'll carry him. It's okay. And the prime minister looked at my dad, who my dad's a disciplinarian, so I don't think anybody had argued with him ever before. And she went, "I will carry him up <laughs> the stairs." Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I remember being very bored while she showed me all these photos of previous prime ministers. <laughs> But I also remember that we were given a gift when we got upstairs and, um, and mine was a giant fire engine. Um, well, it looked giant, I was only small at the time, so it was very big. And then we had, which only, and well, it's my memory playing tricks, but we had a phenomenal buffet. It was a really long table 
And in my head, it was like, even the cakes had motors in and everything was kind of like on a carousel and it was all absolutely phenomenal. Do you want me to go on to the nationwide interview? I think you probably should. This is a good okay. time. Okay. So we had this amazing meal and then there was news, a live news programme called Nationwide with Sue Lawley. I don't know if you ever remember her. And you should never put children on live television. So we were sat not dissimilar as we are now, three children, Sue Lawley, massive, massive cameras. Um, and Sue Lawley said, Lee, um, I hear you've been and had dinner with, and I was six years old, I had dinner with the Prime Minister. And I said, yes, yes, we had a nice dinner. And she said, uh, what, what, what did you have to eat? And I went, lettuce. <laughs> and you can see her start sweating at this point. She said, did you have anything else to eat? Because she knew that this, this meal was like an amazing banquet. And I went, no, just lettuce. <laughs> And then the, the camera went to the, um, to the next child and being interviewed. And then all of a sudden you hear me going, oh, I had tomato as well. <laughs> and this, this live camera didn't know, didn't know where, to, where to watch it. And then um, I remember watching it most Christmases, I think, for quite a few years. And we came to watch it one year and all we saw was Con on the VHS tape. Mm. And all we saw was Concord taking off. And I said, Mum, what's happened? She went, I think I've recorded over it by accident. <laughs> So as in your, you were in media, uh, maybe that could be your job to try, try and find that um, Consid nationwide. Consider it done. Thank you. Interview. C can, we, can we talk about your schooling? Mm. Um, because I found that really interesting. Uh, it, it was a mix, if I understand it correctly, of special school and mainstream school because your parents wanted to get you into a mainstream school. Mm. It wasn't that easy. No, it wasn't a, it wasn't, there was no equality. There wasn't, wasn't a normal. You also uh, say in the book, sorry, to, you, you cut across, you, 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 I'm not an academic and I'm also quite mischievous. So, <laughs> so I, I, mm. I got the sense you, you, you didn't particularly enjoy school uh, and, and you, know, you weren't particularly sort of focused. No, that's very correct. Okay. Was that because you didn't enjoy the subjects? Was the, so what, what, why? Um, I just, you've hit the nail on the head. I wasn't very academic, but I'm very... I've got tons of common sense and quite quick thinking, but as far as absorbing and, and memorising, which uh, I shouldn't say this in educational centres, sometimes being successful. It's not like we're at Staffordshire University. No, well, no. Um, so I'm not going to be weirdy. No, uh, is is memory actually, and uh, on, on how much you can you can memorise, and uh, and I'm more good at problem solving and not not memorising, which kind of links to my disability and coping with everyday life when you get to a flight of stairs and you can't climb stairs, how are you going to get up them? And then it also goes over to my sport of training horses. You've got to be very quick thinking at problem solving. When you're hanging off the side and you're thinking this could be the next broken bone, you need to be mm -hmm. thinking quite quickly. So yeah, I'm not very academic, but I'm very hands-on. And, um, and um, yes, it, and it wasn't taken for granted. In fact, my parents had to argue with the council um, to, um, because it was no, 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 he, he can't go to, um, well, I was, used to go to Horton Lodge at Rudyard, mm. um, but um, without trying to criticise, there was, um, as well as physical disabled uh, disabilities, there were psychological and, and mental disabilities, all mixed in the same classroom. So sometimes the subjects weren't very fulfilling, let's put it that way. And um, although my body was severely affected. There was nothing kind of wrong with my brain, really. And uh, the teachers and, and Chris Orme at the time, who was the headmaster, he sadly passed away in the last few years. Um, they wanted me gone because I was answering every question because I was just sat there, I was sat there bored, mischieving and being mischievous and answering every question. So eventually the council caved in and um, they said to my mum, yes, he can go to um, it was St. Edward's Middle School, and it was the last year of primary school at Cheddleton. Um, uh, and they said he can go to a mainstream school, but um, he's going to have to go with a carer. And my mum said, absolutely not. She said, he is strange enough. She said, he's going to look even more strange if he's got a middle-aged woman carry, walking around with him carrying his bag. She said, he will carry his own bag or he'll make friends and they might carry his bag for him. But if you think he's going to a normal school and having a middle-aged woman following him around, which some people might need that support, but I certainly didn't. She said, uh, and I think that middle-aged woman would have been too shocked at my behaviour at school anyway, if you read the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
so, so in, in the book, you talk very emotionally about one particular, oh my God, moment when your parents, or possibly Santa Claus, surprise you with the gift of a shiny black pony called mm. Duke. Mm. Best Christmas ever. You, you're mm. about 10 at this point. Can yeah. you describe that moment to us? We'd always, ha always had um, pillowcases with our presents in up to that age, I think about the age of eight or nine years old. And uh, it was no different this year. There was not a pony in a pillowcase. But I'd been having lessons at Endon Riding School um, only for about a year. So my brothers are delving into their pillowcases and... And, um, and they get really good presents, don't they? Like, they, they and and you're, a bit, you're a bit put out? Well, no, they also had a Christmas to die for uh, as well, but not in their, not in their uh, pillowcases. And first, uh, like horse brushes for grooming. And I was like, really disappointed. I was like, mum, why have I got horse brushes? And she said, so when you go for your riding lessons, you can brush your pony. I said, but they're already brushed. <laughs> That's really shit present. <laughs> <laughs> Delving a bit more and out comes a bridle. And anyone you don't ride, that's what the reins are connected to, the metal bit in the mouth, everything. And I was like, well, I've got a bridle for a Christmas present. And she was like, well, so the riding school horse can have a new bridle. And I was thinking, this is the worst Christmas present, <laughs> Christmas ever. And I don't think there was a saddle in there, but there must have been somewhere near it was a saddle. And I was like, this is terrible. And, um, and, and they said, well, you best come outside. And, uh, Walked outside, walked up the driveway, and I saw this horse trailer there. And I was like, oh my, OMG, OMFG. OMG, really? FG. FG. O uh, yeah, FG. And, uh, and that year, I was given the naughtiest pony that, got, that ever existed on this planet. And he came out, and he was black and shiny, and he booked me off every single day. And I was absolutely rubbish. He lost, I lost loads of confidence. And uh, if there was a mistake in parenting, they bought me a pony far too early. But my brothers, one brother had a miniature tractor. But when I say miniature, like only half the size of a normal tractor, so it was still quite big. And then my eldest brother had a, a motorbike, a monkey bike. So it was, uh, it was just a dream. It was, it was just a dream come true, really. Was that the start of your, I mean, you, you say you were already having riding lessons anyway, but that was that was that the start of the sort of equestrian sort of love affair, sort of that, that, that pony booking and all sorts? Was that, mm. was that the start of it? No, think? I think it probably was when I, I started lessons. That was the start of how difficult it was. And uh, I, didn't, I never broke any bones. I went on to break a lot of bones uh, in, in, in my career. But... Uh, I, I, I joke that I just loved, I love watching horses and as a kid I was probably watching a lot of cowboy films but I'm not sure I was watching the horses or the cowboys to be honest, uh, in all honesty. Um, but um, I just love horses. It's, it, I can't really describe how I love them and my relationship with them is, is unique because um, you have People that own horses and love horses, and um, and I think they're just a little bit crazy because they nearly would have them in the house if, if they could. I don't love them like that. I love them because I think they're beautiful, strong, powerful, forgiving animals, uh, and and I love the relationship that I that I that I have with them. But there is an element of a of a professional uh, relationship with the horses, but also an absolute pure just love love for them but um yeah kind of not like you know our doggy people have like a different rug color for the dog for every day of the week we're not like that with the horses the vets love that my horses actually get treated really they have the best of everything but they get turned out in the field in the mud because some olympic horses do not get that luxury and mine get treated like normal horses and and um, just have a very much mutual respect for each other before I forget, when did you think, or did you ever think, I can make a career out of this? When did you, because normally when, when, you know, I'm, a, I'm growing up and I'm thinking, oh, I want to I wanna go in the RAF, I want to, yeah. all these mad ideas, I want to play pool for a living. You know, what, did you, was there a point where you thought, actually, I could, I could do this? I thought, From school, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a bit sarcastic, I was grateful for, uh, being allowed to go on a YTS scheme. From the YTS scheme, I was grateful that the co-op gave me an office job. 
six years later, after sat next to the most miserable middle-aged women that you've ever met, and me being sat there punching numbers in a computer whilst nightclubbing and being very exhausted, and then punching numbers in a computer for six years, I, uh, I became depressed. Um, and uh, and I, I am allergic to horses, which is amu amuses people. I have antihistamines daily for that. And I joke that I'm allergic to paperwork. I absolutely hate paperwork. I lose so much money being allergic to paperwork, you would not believe it. Um, and, um, and it wasn't more a case of I knew what I wanted to do when I, when I finally had to leave the co-op. Um, it was more I knew that what I didn't want to do was sit in an, off an, an office indoors. I'm not an indoorsy person. And uh, yeah, I was going stir crazy. And at the time, the Atlanta Paralympics in 1996 had happened and I realized they had a question events. Um, probably not enough time t today, but I kind of grew up, once I left that special school, I didn't really know any disabled people. I knew of one family friend whose daughter had got a, a disability, but I didn't, I was not only kind of ignorant of disability at that stage, I was quite phobic of disability because when you've been put in that box and you fought along with your parents to get out of that box, any association just created kind of anxiety with me. I was literally one of those people that if there was a wheelchair rolling towards me on a pavement, I'd cross the road because I'd think, Jesus Christ, I do not want to look like a disabled person's day out licking windows, do you know what I mean? I was like, you can't, I literally was very, very phobic uh, of it. So I saw the Atlanta Paralympics on TV and I was like, oh my God, they have horsey events, it's dressage. Dressage, I think, is probably the most, after golf, sport, cricket is the most boring sport God ever invented. It's horses going round in circles and then a few more circles. Like, do I really want to do that? But I'm riding horses for pleasure and low level against able-bodied riders. Um, and, um, but I've kind of absolutely shit scared of everybody with a disability. Um, so what, what do I do? And uh, I thought, well, ring the number. There's one, another long story there where I won't bore you with that. And eventually I got assessed. Eventually I got uh, invited to the national kind of training center. And I just dripped with sweat because there was wheelchairs, there was people wobbling, there was people dribbling, there was people shaking. And I was like, oh my God, I fought most of my childhood to get away from, away from this. And now I've just thrown myself back in it again. And uh, long story short, I'm a much better person accepting my best man at my civil partnership um, is Ricky, was by Ricky Balshaw, he had cerebral palsy. And, and so when people say, oh, I'm a bit frightened of people with disability or I'm a bit ignorant, they don't expect me to say, well, I know exactly how you feel. In fact, I'm probably worse because I was, I was ignorant, and, but I was also probably very phobic because of just when you've been through what I've been through and fought to get away, weirdly your head kind of gets, wants to get away from individuals as well as, as, well as the association, do you know what I mean? And, um, and lots of my best friends now have disabilities and, and um, after the assessments, um, they um, got me training with some of the best trainers in the country and then I, I started to realize that dressage wasn't so boring and, um, it is about the relationship you develop with the horse and also treating the horse and encouraging the horse to be more athletic. So it's more about like, if you imagine like gymnastics on the floor for a human, that's what dressage is about. So a lot of the work we do is, is about encouraging them to be more balanced and stronger and more powerful. So then when, when we do a display, it's the best display that we can kind of do. And that bond that you get with a horse who can't sp speak, they can't verbalize. So very much you use feel through your hips and your bottom and you can you try and feel any tension down the reins and um, and it's um, it's like driving a formula one car it's so precise uh, at a high level so i always say like riding school horses are like a like a, a fiesta ford fiesta and and if people say oh can we have a set on one of your horses i'm like well do you think you could drive a formula one car i'm like no probably won't let you set one of my horses because you'd be on them for seconds before they um, had you on the floor having a little giggle. Because they've all got their own humour as well. You just mentioned the magic word, nightclub, so I'm going to drag you back, if, <laughs> if you don't mind, to, uh, I think it's 1991. 
I was definitely in Valentino's with you, 100%. Um, I'm Stalker. Two, I'm two Stalker. years older, yeah. I'm he two knew. years older than you, uh, but, but we would have been there at the same time. Uh, Valleys, as Shall we used to call it. Shall we just stop that, just yeah. in case? No, 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 okay. I think, I think it's, it's, it's all good. So Valleys, we used to call it, yeah? Yeah. Um, you're 17. Um, Probably about a bit before that, <laughs> illegally. <laughs> it's fine now. So you're, shall we say, um, unsure of your sexuality at this point? Probably had no idea, really. I just thought everybody was playing behind the bike sheds at school like mm. I did. Well, they were, because I wasn't there on my own, <laughs> blatantly. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought it was just experimental, mm. which I do believe to this day that can be just experimental, even if you uh, don't turn to the dark side, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think lots of people experiment, and I think it's a massive... Uh, sexuality is kind of a one to a hundred and on percentages and some everyone somewhere whether you're zero or whether you're a hundred but mm. I think I started having a realization that I was having feelings that I didn't want to have which I think for perhaps ignorant people they think that you want to have certain feelings perhaps for the same sex it's not it's it's something that I did not want to have whatsoever so there is uh a man, a gentleman, at the club. Uh, and there's you, a few. There's a few. But I think you were talking I'm going to focus on one. about one. Because we only got a couple of it. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and, and you have what, what I'll describe as your first sort of cloak and dagger encounter. And, and I say that because it was a bit of a, you, you, it was done behind sort of people's backs. People thought one thing was happening, you were getting off with a girl and you weren't. It, it was a man. Um, you had a brief relationship. And I think it's, you, there's a realisation that you're, probably gay um, and then you sound terrified in the book because you describe yourself as feeling like the only gay in Stoke-on-Trent <laughs> and the only gay in Great Britain. I Just thought it was mind. me and Kenny Everett. <laughs> you and Kenny Everett, I that thought was it was it. me and Kenny Everett because mm -hmm. Ken Kenny Everett was the only person on television that you blatantly realised swung the same way. Mm. So I was like, my life's hell. I do not want to be with Kenny Everett. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's only me and him. <laughs> so this is just not good. Several people are now Googling Kenny Everett because they can't Yeah, because they're too... I did <laughs> have a glance and look at the age range and thinking... Yeah, yeah. Kenny Everett was a very camp, very effeminate, very outrageous man who used to sit something on a chair like this and throw his legs around, but it, I'd worry I'd lose mine over was the all, back if I attempted a Kenny Everett But it was all flick. done in the best possible taste. Thank you, it was. Yeah, um, which was his statement. So... Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't want, although I fully accept myself, and even to this day, I don't know if I'm gay, bi, pansexual, uh, uh, although the book is written gay and the media write me as gay, I think there's still a little bit of fluidity there. Calm down, ladies, calm down, <laughs> calm down. Very, very fussy, very fussy. Um, um, yeah, I didn't, it, it was a massive psychological battle. I didn't want... Although I'm a proud of myself as a person now, however much, uh, even in the 90s, society still was not very broad-minded at all, um, nobody could have hated me more than I hated me. So You can you feel the pain to, in the book. You, you, can, you, to, can, you can feel it. You have I, to I, deal with that. You have to deal with yourself before you can even deal with your family, friends, and then society. Which is a great segue on to, you kept the secrets of your sexuality from your loved ones because I think it was a different time and because you were genuinely frightened about what the reaction would be. You were embarrassed, you were scared. Mm. Um, and then you have the talk with your mum. Because she's... Well, up to that stage, yeah. I'd also wanted to commit suicide. So that's the degree of hatred of yourself. Self-loathing, really, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you were avoiding it, weren't you? You're clearly avoiding having a conversation. Mm. You're looking away from your parents. Mm. Your relationship with them well, is Well, my dad worked nights at that stage, so it was often uh, me and mum. I don't know where my brothers were. Maybe they were, yeah, they would have been an age. They would have probably, my middle brother had gone into the army and my eldest brother might have even been lived. I don't, I don't know where, where he was, but it was just often evenings of me sat on one sofa and my mum sat on the other and just for you, I, for, you, for at least two years, yeah, you're just looking through the television, you're not even watching anything, and you're, you're, I'm looking at my mum thinking, ask me, ask me, but don't ask me, ask me, ask me, but don't ask me. 
and she, actually she had no idea. She had got nothing to ask because she didn't even have any concept of what I was going through and the way I was feeling. But in the end, it is your mum who kind of forces the, the issue. She found a letter yeah. uh, on the spare bedroom floor after a friend had stayed, sneaked through to my bedroom in the middle of the night, but a friend had stayed in the spare bedroom. And yeah, and she said, uh, I found a letter on the floor and uh, she says, uh, she says, you do, and she says something along the lines of, um, if you're gay, your father won't be able to cope with it. And going right back to, I don't think I'm better than anybody else and I don't think anyone's better than me. Although there was loads of fears going on, that was just like red rag to a bull because my dad was not a bully or anything like that, but he was a disciplinarian, do you know what I mean? And he was probably racist, probably sexist, probably homophobic. Um, we've moulded him a little bit better now. Uh, he's a bit more accepting of people. He's very accepting of people. Um, and, uh, well, actually, she said, uh, she said, are you gay? And, I went, and, and, and my brain was just in turmoil. And my, my brain was telling my mouth to get tell her yes. And I went, no. Even though I'd sat there for years wanting her to ask me, I just literally went, no. And then she said, if, you're, if you are gay, your father won't be able to cope with it. And I that just so angry. And I just turned and I just went, well, he'll have to then, won't he? He'll have to deal with it. And then she said, I'm going to pour myself a Bacardi and Coke. Do you want one? <laughs> and I went, I'll have a double, please. <laughs> And it was a, a, a long, stressful, tearful evening, which actually didn't end the way I expected it to end. How did your dad take it? Me and my mum talked, and she was... Um, though she denies it, she was quite angry. The feelings I was getting was quite angry. Um, but she went into kind of more practical mode, and I said, like, I can't go through these feelings... Um, it would be called coming out now. Um, each time a new family member gets told, so tomorrow I want, just tell everybody, just tell everybody. And she says, no, I can't do that. She says, I've got to get my head around it first and everyone's going to handle it differently, so we need to. And I said, make sure you tell my dad. Um, anyway, we'd agreed that to go to bed and, and my dad couldn't be told just at the moment because she needed to work out kind of the best route to tell him. And I agreed with that. Uh, as long as this torture wasn't going to be prolonged much, much, much further. And uh, my adrenaline's up even now talking about it. I hear my voice going a little bit queasy. Um, she came into my bedroom quite early and once again she was still quite stern really, is the best way to put it. She sat on the edge of the bed, she went, I told your dad. I was like, you spent most of the evening last night telling me not to tell my dad. She says, I know. She says, but you know, he goes into telephone box every night because there wasn't mobiles then. And he phones home every night. She he's says, driving, he's, away driving. he's driving, yeah, <laughs> nights. And uh, she said, and I just started crying on the phone. And then all the, and then you got all these emotions because you're hurting the people closest to you. It was only me that was hurt before. And I could kind of cope with that. And I said, why did you start crying? She says, because you've been through so much with your disability. She says, I just don't want you to go through any more pain. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, kind of, kind of get that. Um, I said, but why did you tell him? She says, well, I had to, he's my husband. I had to tell him why I was crying on the phone. And I was thinking, I wonder if, it, oh no, I wonder if he didn't take it so badly. I said, how did he take it? And she went, he's been physically sick all night. He literally had to stop the lorry to get out the lorry to be sick. So you've moved on from the trauma that you've been through in yourself and now you're putting your family through that torture. Not torture, through that shit. <laughs> and your dad didn't speak to you for a while. Mm -hmm. he, he, he blanked you. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, it was, it was really tough for a couple mm -hmm. of months, three months. Mm -hmm. And it was quite fearful because having a severe disability and I needed not, I don't need a lot of care, but I needed help to get the plastics on. I needed help to get my shoes on because I can't reach my feet. So you're living in, a, in a, an environment that you still need mm. some physical help. So it wasn't like I could storm out at to whatever age I was and go and live in a flat because it was just not practically as easy as that. Um, so, yeah, 
yeah, it was very tough and uh, I would not want to put my dad down. It was the generation he was brought up with. It was, it, it, it was the way he, yeah, the way he thought at the time. But um, yeah, it was really tough. He didn't speak to me. And I do remember my mum saying something along the lines that it should said, um, if you're ashamed of what the people or your neighbours, the neighbours would think of having a son who's gay, then imagine what they're going to think if you throw him out on the streets. And it, so that kind of statement was like, whew, I was allowed to live at home, but it still wasn't the nicest way of living at home, knowing that you were not really wanting to be there. Fast forward to now, um, things have changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. Both your parents, incredibly accepting of who you are. Um, I, I, I said to you earlier, there's a kind of recurring dark stoic sense of humour running through the book, which is definitely, you can tell he's written it himself. I mean, it, it really does kind of go through it. I get the sense that that kind of, that dark sense of humour and that kind of ability to laugh as a family and, and, and deal with um, really difficult and challenging situations has got you all through it. I don't, think we, I don't think we laugh as a family through those situations. I think it's just we're very strong people. Um, we've been brought up to be strong so actually then don't complain when your youngest child is that strong that he goes, this is me, you have to deal, you can have your opinions, but you're not, you can't change the way I am. And it's not even my opinion, because it's not an opinion. You can't change, your opinions aren't going to change who I am. So you can be as ist as you want to be, but it's not going to change anything. You're only gonna then have turmoil yourself, because I'm strong enough to go to go. You actually say, don't you, because of my disability, I have a will of iron. I've learned how to be tough. Yeah. Uh, and that's because you've been through, in your life, at different times, some really difficult, painful, challenging... Uh, the bit where you talk about coming out, the I am who I am, is, um, is really powerful because I can feel, the, the reader feels the pain. Mm -hmm. um, I in many ways, that's the toughest read for me. That's the... Yeah. And if anything, if this book, let's say, gets sold internationally and it goes to countries where people think perhaps it's still a decision that you can, that you can decide who you am, hopefully the pain that you feel from that book will extend to changing people's lives and making lives easier around the world. Do you know what I mean? I know that sounds a bit like a beauty pageant kind of statement, but I don't mean it like that. I just mean it as in people think it's an easy decision to take, do you know what I mean? And, and, and to be a pr proud person, they don't always see the history behind that and the, the turmoil that you've been through as, as a human being, as yourself. Yeah. Let's talk about sport, just for a minute. I'm not so, very good at sport. <laughs> I've, I've lost. I've only been on Question of Sport twice and was on the losing team both times. Well, let's talk I about... I go around in circles on horses, you know. Let's talk about your sport. Okay, that's a bit Which bad. you're quite good at. So, so um, the, we've got three, three of the four team. The latest. The latest from uh, Tokyo. And how heavy are they? Really heavy. I mean, re like, proper, like... You stole them once, heavy. didn't I you? I did. I did. I tried to swap it for a staff sheet you won't have in it. So, um, so... Can you remember the feeling, Lee, when you first represented Great Britain on the international stage? I did a World Championships in 90... I only got assessed in 1998. I did a World Championships in 1999 and became World Champion. But, um, and then I went to the Sydney 2000 uh, as a totally unknown. Um, it was a borrowed horse competition. So whereas dressage, generally, you have your own horse, you train your own horse, you compete your own horse. But because our structure developed from riding for the disabled realistically where the, the centre has horses and you would go to the centre like a riding school um, and they would perhaps take those horses uh, to competitions but very rarely um, the structure was borrowed horse so you pulled a number out of a hat and that was the horse you rode and I was in Australia and uh, the, num the horse I drew was my first draw. Some people redraw if they think the horse is not suitable. But, and it was a pure Arab riding club horse called Chip Chase Meknes. And, um, and I never believed I would be a Paralympian. I never believed I would get a medal. I never believed I would get one gold medal. And I would never believe at those games that I'd come home with three gold medals. But unfortunately, the media wasn't as uh, 
as savvy as they are now, so it wasn't as promoted kind of at the time. The British media have turned things around with the London 2012 games, but the feeling was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. And going back, when I wanted to leave my office job in the co-op, and I tease my parents about this now, uh, my mum was like, well, we've all worked in this family. You're not going to not work. You're not, you're not going to be unemployed. What are you going to do? And I was like, well, I've just seen the Atlanta Paralympics on television. I could drive for that. And she went, are you having a laugh? <laughs> she says, you need, to do, you need to have a proper job. You're not going to go playing with horses. So now I get, uh, mum, knighthood, knighthood, multi-gold medalist. You've been around proper the world job. with me. Yeah, it was you that told me not to. But then that pig-headedness came in. When I, I am a bit like, tell me I can't do something. Yeah and then I have to prove that I can do something. So it was probably the fact that was, my mum told me in my 20s that, I, that, don't be so stupid, it's other people that win gold medals, not you. <laughs> so, right. can, can, can I ask you, did you experience any, um, any difficulties, any encounter any difficulties being an openly gay athlete? Not in dressage. It's spot the straight person in dressage. Really? Yeah. Okay. My best friend Ricky Balshaw is straight and uh, he did the Beijing Paralympics and he actually, uh, and this was it, this was the British dressage, not, not Paralympians, which is probably, I don't know what the membership is, but he set up a club called SMID and uh, he had t-shirts with SMID and it was straight men in dressage and there was four of them. Yeah, minority group, minority group. So I kind of was very intrigued when at the odd time, let's say every four years for Paralympics where, where, where dressage gets a little bit more coverage than normal, I was very intrigued why the, why the sporting media were, were so interested on me being a gay athlete. I didn't really get that because I came up through a sport. Like well, friends. it's not an issue. No, no. Within dressage, it's really not an issue. Within mm. equestrian, it's not an issue. Mm. So I, I didn't understand until, yeah, you do a bit of reading, you listen, you watch, that it, it is an issue within other, within other sports. And that's the point, I think, isn't it? That was the, sort of my next question. Do you think that because of your journey, and you've been doing this a long time now, it's 20-odd years, isn't it? Thank you. You know, without oh, wanting yeah. to remind you of your age. Thank you. You're still younger than me. Um, have you helped to change perceptions by dint of your story and your success, do you think? Do you think it's been helpful to the LGBTQ plus community? Um, I never set out to be helpful. Uh, and cliche with the book, but I've just been who I am. And I never changed, my, changed myself to, to gates. I've never shouted. I've never ran around with a flag. Maybe the opening ceremony flag, but no, ran I ran around with a flag then. Well, I rolled around with the flag. <laughs> That was a dilemma. Do you walk with the flag or do you roll with the flag? And it was very windy days. So I was worried I'd get blown off a mobility scooter, but that's what we went with uh, at Rio. Anyway, um, people say so. Mm. You can't really look from the outside looking in. Um, and I think it came to light at these games, so 20 odd years later, as mm. you said, when I was, when you, you, when you compete at the games, you're allowed to, walk your horse off, cool them down, and then you have to go through a media strip. So you, you get on your crutches or your mobility scooter, and you don't have to speak to the media, but you have to roll or walk through all the, through all the media. Uh, and that's part of your signing up for Paralympic mm. Games, that you do that. And I just remember this, this man, and he looked like he was from Japan, so we will presume he was. And he just said, thank you for being you. How do you feel? competing in a country where people aren't as accepted for their sexualities as they are in Great Britain. And, and like you said, you can feel the pain in that boot. I don't know why, because I, I have been asked the question a reasonable amount of times, but I just saw a, a lot of pain in his eyes. And I'm full of adrenaline because I've just won a gold medal. But then to see this pain for this man, and I just, I didn't really say that much, but I just was like, I can't believe in this day and age around the world that there is still this, these prejudices and people are murdered, um, thrown off buildings, beheaded. That's shocking. Um, and that's when I am proud that I live in Great Britain and proud that we do accept people generally for who they are and what they are and what they, what they, what they give to people, let's say, and what they are as, as an individual. And I just said, yeah, I believe that love should be, love should prevail in this day and age. It shouldn't be uh, people's opinions or religions uh, that um, create cruelty basically around the world and that went a little bit viral uh, this year but it wasn't my intent um, 
and um, but sport gives you a platform to have a voice and thank God for that really because sometimes politicians make the wrong decision and sometimes laws and rules around the world are just very very random and if sports people can just give their positive opinions really uh, it's it is we're very lucky to be to have that platform given what you just said there will be people um, in a not dissimilar situation to yourself who might be teenagers um, they're struggling with lots of things that they, they may be struggling to come out have difficult conversations having the same thoughts you did what advice could you give to someone in that in that position given everything you've been through um. Just fight for that acceptance of yourself, really, because if you don't have that, there's no point trying to fight or, or, or um, gain the acceptance of your family and your friends and, and society, really. So cheesy, but it, it is a case of love yourself. I and mean, you could look at me with my deformed body and think, well, how can you love yourself? But I get up in the morning, I'm more worried about what my hair looks like, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> it takes an awful a little lot bit of sharp today. A lot of selfies. So I'm more worried about what my hair looks like than what my arms and legs look like. And I'm more worried about if I'm going to be late on the school run now than, than whether, than what my sexuality is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Which is a great place to be in your head, I think, probably, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and by this, in the same vein, you know, people, young people perhaps struggling with a disability, coming to terms with a disability. Mm. Um, you know, you've obviously shown that you can go on to be incredibly successful and you are inspirational. You're just going to have to suck it up, mate. <laughs> so, so, he knows I hate so, that uh, statement. Yeah, so, so, but, you know, what would your advice to be to someone who maybe sees a disability and perhaps think that's a limitation? Um... It's the same answer, really. Obviously, a disability can be a limitation. It can limit you. I, I can't climb a mountain. And my surgeon, who uh, is no longer with us anymore, I mean, he operated on me the last time when I was eight or nine years old. He said to my mom, he'll never make a footballer, but I will get him walking. Um, and my mum can get tearful now because he never got to see me what I did do. Mm. I never became a footballer. <laughs> There's time. I'll leave that to my, uh, to my foster son. He's more passionate about football than I am of horses. That's probably another section in, in your questioning. But um, you just you have to find a love for yourself. I do not... Uh, you were quite shocked that I've never actually read my book. I've written my I was, book, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's taken years of editing. And you asked why, and I said, because nobody likes seeing themselves on television. So I don't like seeing a full um, photo of, of me, but I'm well aware what I look like. There's no denial there, but it's like, you perhaps wouldn't want me to take a photo of you and your budgie smugglers. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you can be... What's the context? You can be able-bodied. <laughs> <laughs> you can be able-bodied, handsome, heterosexual but you can still dislike yourself I've got those friends that I support I've got one at the moment who, who, who's not feeling great himself so it is it is your inner strength and your ability no it's not even to love yourself it's your ability just to stand there and 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 believe that you're a good person so why should the extra factors why should the the bits that are labeled disability sexuality even come into that. They, they don't come into that. They're just labels that other people give you. Everyone's got a disability. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You've been through, a t had a tough year. You wouldn't mm. call it a disability, no. but you've had to dig deep psychologically because Facebook tells me you have. Mm. So um, it's just an inner belief that you are a good person and you have a right to be on this planet like the next person and then believe that really. It's a great message. I'm being waved at, which means that I haven't got a lot of time. 40 minutes up. But I think we, we, we're probably beyond that now. But I've got to ask a couple of very quick questions before okay. we throw it to the audience. So last year, I think it was last year, you became a foster parent? I did. Uh, and anyone who knows you can see what this means to you. I see your Facebook. 
Um, tell us a little bit about that journey and, and, and Jensen and, and, and yeah. what it's, what's it like to be a dad? Yeah. Um, I've considered having my own family. There's the practicalities and the dynamics uh, and finding the right woman just never really happened. Um, and I've considered fostering for about 10 years, if not longer. Um, just never felt the right time. And then through COVID number one, I'm, I, I, I inquired about it and uh, uh, the council got in touch and I was, once again, although I believe what I've just told you, I was a little bit insecure that my disability, my sexuality might go against me really, but I also had a li tiny little flicker of hope that it wouldn't. And then, I know it sounds a little bit cheesy, but in this day and age, it can't go against you in this country. Do you know what I mean? That is prejudiced, really. But even so, I'm pretty abnormal. And the interesting thing, through all the training and, and then all the assessments, they were more worried about my sports than they were my arms and legs or who I slept with because or didn't sleep with lately. Because, um, because of having that professional career, really, and the timings. So being away from the, for, from the yeah. child. Yeah, but I'm not actually away that much. And then I had to admit that I only ride one horse every day, so I actually have lots of lions. So I was just telling everybody I was really, really busy. Um, so I actually had time for a child because I could do the school run and then I could do my horses and then I could do the school run. And although I'm a, usually in Europe for a competition in spring uh, and then an international in this country and then whichever championship, my year goes in four year cycles, Europeans, World Equestrian Games or World Championships, Europeans and Paralympics and then it starts again. That I'm not actually out the, out the country that much really if I choose not, not to be. Um, and um, and very very thorough assessments for everybody, um, but it's a um, it's a reflection on how you are, but it's also a reflection of your upbringing and your support group and and, and your beliefs. Um, and and then last June, um, I got approved. Then I was petrified. Um, and quite interestingly, um, through COVID number one, I had my godson for, uh, for a week. Three months later, he returned home because Uncle Lee's is just good fun. I live on a farm. I've got quad bikes. I've got ducks, chickens, rears, dogs. Um, and COVID number one, can you remember the weather was phenomenal. So um, his, um, no, my other, my goddaughter, separate family had visited for a weekend and bought a, a paddling pool uh, nine foot by six foot i remember it immensely and my plumber had installed a hot tap outside my house when the cold taps were frozen that goddaughter had left the paddling pool on purpose so we could use it so every day me and my godson added like a bath mount of water into the paddling pool he could have it for an hour or so, and then I'd chuck him out, and i float like a disabled otter. So what I did, because you couldn't go on holiday, I used to lie in this nine foot by six foot paddling pool with added warm water and pretend I was on holiday. But anyway, I was regressing. Three months later, my godson was still alive, so this was giving me hope that I could keep another human alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So which I is thought, important. Which is important mm -hmm. if you're going, and, I, and during that, I was going through the training and the assessment, so that was giving me confidence. But then when I got, uh, got approved, I was like, oh my God. So I had a young man uh, with me for three months, and then he unfortunately had to go elsewhere. And then last September the 9th, I, um, I was introduced to Jensen. And the reason I can discuss him now, because of, um, potentially the media wanting to inter in interview him during Tokyo. We had to have some emergency meetings with the local authority because some children are very vulnerable and their parents shouldn't know who they're living with, where they're living and what, and, and, and what they're up to. Uh, but Jensen isn't in that situation. So the local authority gave us um, authority that he could be seen and interviews. And I said, well, if he can be interviewed, can he be on my social media as well? Because it's still very strange as a, as a foster dad. You still feel sometimes you have to do that kind of, please, can you step out the photo? And that's really uncomfortable as a human and as a parent. Um, so, um, and the panic was, uh, I FaceTimed home from Tokyo every day to speak to my mum and Jensen. Jensen stayed with my mum and dad. Um, my mum pampers him to hell, so he loves staying there, but mum does say, he's missing you. I was like, well, I'll be home soon. 
And Jensen was very excited to say that um, Midlands Today are coming round and interview me and your mum and dad. I was like, uh, uh. At that point, he couldn't be seen and certainly on media. I was like, just, just put that on pause just briefly. Let's see if we can get, get that approved. And, um, and understandably, he has his issues about being looked after, uh, a looked after child. Um, but he's gained so much confidence that I told him I was going on to Lorraine and, and I said, she, she, I know that she's, because I met her on the last leg the week before and she's like, Lee, will you come on the Lorraine show next week? I was like, yeah, just can we talk about fostering? I said, we can. So I spoke to Jensen and said, how much do you want me to talk about? Are you okay with me going on that show and talking about fostering? Because uh, he was still kind of at the cusp of not particularly wanting people to know and nothing that he'd done, there's no reflection of him, but it's the stigma really. And he said, I'll come on and speak as well. I was like, really? He said, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, her legals wouldn't allow it, but she explained, she said, Lee, I can't even have a front cover of a national newspaper on the table in front of me. She says, that's how strict my legals are. Never mind interviewing somebody like Jensen. And I was like, okay. And anyway, um, we were, he'd never been to London. So we made, mum and dad came, Jensen came, and they came to the green room, uh, my dressing room, sorry. Uh, before the show and <laughs> Lorraine walked in she's like hi you were Celeste's parents and she's exactly backstage like you like she is on on television uh, no airs and graces and Jensen could hardly look her in the eye and hardly speak to her I said well it's a bloody good job we didn't go on live television I said because you would have sat there and said nothing <laughs> like a proper teenager and grunted so um, as you can see I'm quite passionate I'm I'm so proud of him um, as, as a human being he's doing brilliantly in school uh, just had pet online parents evening, right. literally minutes before coming here, and the teachers are very, very pleased with him, very proud on it uh, of him. And yeah, I I hate getting up early in the morning, but I love the school run and kind of the structure and the love and that you get back from a child is is indescribable, uh, really. And the emotions, I cry, I laugh. I said to my mum. I said, I never ever, um, what's the best way to word it? I never, I planned for the un school uniform, I planned for clothing, planned for food. He, Jensen decorated his bedroom, planned for all the practical things. I never planned for the emotion that came with it, really. And I said to mum, I've never had a feeling, I never expected to have a feeling of caring more for somebody else than you do yourself. That was a very strange feeling. I've cared about myself for years, do you know what I mean? I've been number one. And then all of a sudden I'm number two. In my, in my own head, I'm number two. That's a very, even partners have never made number one. They've still been number two. Um, so very strange when you have uh, children, a child. To, I, never, I never planned for those feelings really. So I cry through happiness sometimes, uh, more than probably sadness really. And as I said before, he's unbelievably passionate about football, unbelievably good. So he's so disinterested in what I do. He learned to ride a horse in th three sessions. He learned to ride Zeon, who was my uh, Rio Paralympic horse. Now Zeon is a unicorn and he's currently been leased by a blind rider who has gained so much confidence. But anyway, Jensen learned to ride and has never been on a horse since. Uh, he's He's frightened of the horses, but he'll go up and get on one if the groove is a holding, but he's absolutely got zero interest. But it's really good because I will, I'm very much a people person. I'm very much concerned that the attention that his, um, his parent, his dad was receiving might not go down very well, very easily, but he's been, he's been brilliant. He asks what I'm up to, but he hasn't been jealous that I'm in the me been in the media. He hasn't been embarrassed that I've been in the media. Um, and a quick story, the day he moved in, I've got these individual sofas pushed up next to each other. And, um, and the, that, we had tea and everything, and then we, fires on, TV's on, he says, I'm gonna sit over here, which was one sofa space between us. I dread if he's watching this. I so didn't give him the link, because I knew we'd be talking about him to tonight's chat. He says, I'm gonna sit over here. And I said, yeah, that's really sensible. I said, because if you actually sat near me, you could catch the gay gene and he was laughing his head off. And then within a month, if he could have sat on my shoulders, then that's where he would be sat. And that's how he doesn't see my disability, sexuality. My friend, Ricky Balshaw, uh, who I've discussed already, great friend, uh, he visited one day and Jensen was a little bit like protective of him and 
and, and pampering him and no play fighting with him or anything. And I said, and when Ricky had left, I said, uh, how come you were dead like careful with Ricky? And he went, Lee, he's disabled. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm just dad. It does I'm sound just, like you're doing a great job, dad. And his humor is worse than mine. I'm telling you now, I know that's difficult to believe, but he doesn't see my success. He's aware of, he doesn't see sexuality, disability. He just cares whether I've made a meal that he likes and whether he's just got a, a loving home and family, and that's what he has now. Which is wonderful to hear. Now, c can I just ask somebody, Kitty, can we carry on? Uh, yeah, we are uh, yeah. We're, we're, Right, okay, so we're gonna carry on. I've got more questions, but I'm conscious that there'll be people in the audience who do want to ask uh, Lee questions. So would you like to raise your hand if you'd like to, uh, to ask a question? If not, we can just go to the pub. <laughs> and going to the pub with him would be great. So <laughs> I'm quite quiet. Any questions? Yeah, um, how important was it that the way Channel 4 got behind the British Paralympic movement back in 2012? Because it was the first time I believe that the Paralympics was televised live throughout a full schedule. Yeah. So shows like The Last Leg and they had Par Paralympics breakfast. And yeah, it was. Show. It was ph phenomenally important and the British media, no word of a lie, led the way with the message that we should uh, treat Paralympic sport and Paralympic athletes the same as we would um, the Olympic, the warm-up class as I call it, um, we, because obviously they warm up, they get all the facilities fine and then we go in. So we call, we, Paralympians call the Olympics the warm-up class. But, um, no, up to the Rio Games, it was Rio before London, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, even the British media, a little bit, were always Olympics, Olympics, and occasionally the Paralympics would be an add-on. But the moment we got the Games, I don't know if you guys all got together or if it was an underlying kind of current, it was always Olympics and Paralympics or Paralympics and Olympics. And I think that got into the psyche of, uh, uh, of people living in Great Britain and also I think media around the world realise that you shouldn't be leaving Paralympians out of the scenario really. So I was really proud technically of the amount of hours and in, even then in Tokyo, uh, Channel 4 covered even more sports and there was, I think it was 24 hour streaming at least um, so uh, of the sport. So very proud that the British media respected the Paralympians and, and once again sent that message around the world because even the likes of America, they had to watch British television to see their own athletes in the background, which is shocking really. So yeah, another great message that um, we've sent out. Thank you. Thank Any you. more questions? And I love the jumper. <laughs> Thank you. For those who can't see, the jumper says, um, boys get sad too. Boys get sad too. Which is true. Um, any more questions? Because I've got a few. Oh, at the back there. Ashley, two questions, but on a fire my lab session. Yeah, go for it. So the first question is, um, how does it feel like being a gay man in um, a conservative society? Do you think that you have like, the same benefits and privileges than John Wilson if he's, say, a heterosexual man would? Um, I was aware when I came out you wouldn't have got the same privileges as, as a heterosexual man, but obviously we're dealing with my disability as well as sexuality. But I did definitely feel that um, minority groups were not treated with respect or, and definitely not, not equally. Um, so once again, as you've probably gathered through the talk, I haven't actually screamed. I only mention my disability and sexuality when I'm being interviewed. It never really comes up for discussion, but I mean, I'm aware of being an out athlete and simple things of being in Rio and my fellow 263 athletes, maybe not all of them, voted for me to be flag bearer. Now, I didn't want to actually brag, but if you look back at those interviews, I say something along the lines and everybody kind of knows that I wasn't on about my disability because I was in a Paralympic village with 4,000 disabled people, athletes. But I was, I was saying things along the lines that I'm honored and humble that my fellow athletes have voted a very unique person like myself. That was kind of an up yours to the likes of Russia and Saudi Arabia and other, other nations that would not put a unique person like myself as a flag bearer. Um, so that's probably the most political you'll ever see me, but uh, I'd like to believe my employment and my successes 
have not been down to either my sexuality or my disability, it's been down to my pig-headedness that I can ride this horse and turn it around and make it dance. I encourage you to dance. We don't make them, we encourage them to dance. And um, second question, um, I just saw that the AIDS epidemic, like they um, aged over two days ago. Yeah. Um, where were you and what were you thinking? What was going on in your head during that long time? Wow. Um, no, no, I don't mind personal at all because we, we kind of jumped through a lot of the <laughs> shocking bits in the book, which I thought Martin was going to be. I received quite a lot of attention in my younger years and uh, my awful humour, and I slept with a reasonable amount of people, but I, would, but, uh, I was very safe in answer to your question. But I used to think, why does, why does everybody want to sleep with me? I used to think everybody got a cripple fetish. Do you know what I mean? I used to think, God... <laughs> is, there a, is there a group for this? Do you know what I mean? Um, but it was probably just my awful humour and etc, uh, etc. Et so um, I'm glad now that there's the drugs available that hopefully one day, you never know, it might be eliminated, uh, AIDS and HIV. Um, and, but obviously it was very scary times during them, but I, um, I actually didn't sleep around that much, um, but you just, I would just be very, very careful. Do you think history is repeating itself with the coronavirus? Like, is it, does it feel like HIV is repeating itself, but in a book? No. <laughs> no, I think it's just another version of flu that uh, can have a much stronger impact on, on human beings. I think nature has a way, uh, I do not want to be political, of, of sorting humans out a little bit and, 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 and nature, the planet has a way of speaking for itself in, in, in one way and as much as I would never ever want anybody to catch the coronavirus, but that's what goes in the back of my head, I think I don't believe that it was invented by China. I believe that it's just a form of, and the way it's mutating is what the fl what flu-like symptoms do. Um, but hopefully scientists can get on top of it that, that nobody loses any loved ones. I have got very close friends that have lost loved ones, so it's extremely traumatic. But I think we just all have to do our bits to, uh, to keep vulnerable people safe, and uh, hopefully the scientists will get on top of it. There's a question over here, I think, from the gentleman that's got up here. What do you and your horse talk about? <laughs> <laughs> the weather, we're British. Mm -hmm. um, because of how finite, I, I hug them and I kiss them, even though literally my face gets sometimes swollen, my lips do, I don't need any injections in I these lips, I tell you. I know, I'm so, right. and uh, my asthma gets very bad, but when we, my horses actually wouldn't appreciate me chitter chatting to them when I'm riding them. They are very fine tuned into the vocal commands that I am allowed to do because able bodied people actually aren't allowed to give vocal commands when they compete, but we all do talk to us horses. Um, but it's so precise that if I moved the reins with my little finger, if I had my head here instead of here, the horses actually can feel our partnership is so strong that they feel and hear so acutely that um, if I was to chitter chat to them, it would dilute that or that they would get they would get confused. So I can feel that they appreciate me being very consistent with my vocal and physical um, questions to them. That uh, we save kind of chitter chatter to the end. And then there is a Facebook video of me and Breeze. I'd had a bit too much French wine from the French. Um, and I was at his stables when my groom was videoing me having a very tipsy conversation with him outside the stable and thanking him for being very brave on my last test in, in, in Tokyo. So I do have, once again, a very unique relationship with them. It's a great question. Any more questions? Yeah. I think they got last place. So what went wrong there? Was it the triathletes or something like that? Yeah. So it was the able-bodied triathletes. And um, 
once again, that was borrowed horse competitions, and that's a very precarious because the, the, the riders have pulled a number out of a hat and ridden that horse, and we can go into how crazy that was for disabled people, 70-odd disabled people in, in, in um, what was after Athens? Beijing. Yeah. yeah. So up for Athens, was, it was Sydney, sorry, doing the draw. So the, those horses, um, the, the athletes have done the shooting, the running, I think the cycling, and the show jumping is an element of that. So they're on a strange horse, and for whatever reason, that horse um, did not want to jump on that day. And they handled the situation just very badly. Um, as, as humans, you, you should just have bowed out and gone, OK, but they got a little bit bullyish with the horses. The, the irony is a horseman, in this day and age, you have to and want to treat animals fairly, but horses absolutely beat the living muck out of each other in a the field. They bite each other, they kick each other, they barge each other, they're very physical. So I know, even though the coach actually leant over and, and, and went to punch out, push the horse, that was shocking and it went viral and she shouldn't have done it, but I do know that the horse would have not actually felt that because the moment he, would, he or she would have been in the field, her, his or she, her equine partners would have done far, far worse. But in this day and age, you can't be working, having animals for pleasure and, and treating them that way. So it was just very, very uh, handled very badly, really. But I know that the horse would have been okay. I'm conscious of time, ladies and gentlemen. So I've got three very quick questions. Okay, and you've, only got, you've only got 10 seconds to Thank answer. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I do blabber on so, a little so, bit. So, so what would you say has been your proudest moment as a rider in your sport? Just getting on a horse in the first place. Yeah, Not just, winning medals? Nope, just getting on it. If somebody walked up my driveway the way I walk, I wouldn't even let them on a horse. You know what I mean? I'd be like, no, no, turn around. <laughs> so just getting on a horse. You are, of course, a CBE and a Knight of the Realm. Um, what's it feel like to be a Knight of the Realm? Very strange. As a man, I thought I'd always be a mister. Uh, I never. Like, if you're a miss, you may become a missus if you meet the right bloke, do you know what I mean? But, like, as a man, you never expect your title to change. Politically, I've said the honour system needed to be a bit more equal, so then people said, oh, he wants a knighthood many years ago. I didn't want a knighthood, I was just stating the obvious, that they would, an Olympian could win one gold medal and a Paralympian needs to go to numerous Paralympic Games and still wouldn't get the same honour. Then I became a knight and it took, it's taken quite a while to realise I'm not a mister anymore but I'm not a miss either. I'm a sir. Very strange. One final question. Yep. You're 47, <laughs> but I know you moisturise, you look great. I don't actually, so, I'm just very greasy. Um, you're 47, <laughs> what, what next for Sir Lee Pearson? Well, I was thinking motorsport, and I had a few chats with quite influential people, but I went on a track day the other day and I got beaten by quite a few housewives. So I'm thinking maybe I'm not going to make a very good racing driver. Um, acting. I've always okay. been treated in acting. And I've always wanted to be a James Bond, bo James Bond baddie. Right. Well, I thought, what's the last James Bond called? What was his name? Daniel Craig. Yes. I thought he doesn't look dissimilar to me. Maybe not as attractive. But, I mean, he's, he's getting there. He's blonde. Do you know what I mean? Similar age. I could be his evil cousin. The baddies have always had some form of disability or yeah. deformity. I don't need to make that shit up. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's already here. I've got that as a given. I can ride a horse, drive a sports car, ride a motorbike, quad bike. I, I can pretend to be really evil. Please, will you contact the powers that be to say, well, as they're getting a new James Bond this time, maybe they need a new baddie. And I could be like James... What's that? What's he called? James, Daniel Craig's like yeah, yeah. evil cousin that yeah, yeah. came back to, I don't know. Duffy, I can feel Duffy an Mott. online petition coming on. I think it'd be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, possible future Bond villain and uh, 14 aim times high, high. gold medal winner, would you please give it up for Sir Lee Pearson? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike.